That was sweet. All of us with the same words coming from our heart and praise, proclaiming the glory of the Lord's death on our behalf. And now we're going to do the same thing. We're going to take a piece of bread and a cup of juice, physical reminders that God the Son t- took on a physical body so that he could die in our place. So we're going to be opening our Bibles to Mark chapter 15, verse 22. If you do not have a Bible, can you raise your hand? We have some men who would love to give you your own copy so that you could see God's word for yourself. We're going to read in Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 22 of Jesus giving his body and blood for us. Then, verse 22, they brought him to the place, Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. And they tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide who should take what. Now it was the third hour and they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right, one on his left. We read here of the perfect son of God crucified, nailed to a cross. He was born for this. This month, We see all around us reminders, a world proclaiming that which most of them don't know, that that God took on flesh. He was incarnated and meted. He took on flesh and blood so that he could do this. So that in apparent weakness, he could have nails driven through that flesh Blood pour out. The only man who ever lived without sin, righteousness incarnated, he was treated as a criminal. He was unjustly accused by man and justly punished by God. He was sentenced to death by man in a sham trial the one by whom, for whom, and through whom all things were made, the Lord of all. Think about it. Remind yourself who this is, who it says was crucified. He had his clothes stripped from him so that he would hang in humiliation. He was unjustly accused by Jewish leaders condemned unjustly by Roman rulers, crucified unjustly by soldiers. The charge, king of the Jews, was hung above his head, not in order to proclaim who he really was, although that statement was true, but it was hung above his head to mock him. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords was not less in control in this scene than in any other throughout all of history. He hung in apparent weakness on the cross with a crown of thorns on his head, clothes distributed among his murderers and robbers 
on his right and left. But he hung not helpless, but in love. We sung about it. He hung in victory. Though those who saw him could not see it. Look down again, Mark 15, 29. Look at what those who, came, who walked by saw. Those passing by were blaspheming him, shaking their heads and saying, ha, you who are going to destroy the sanctuary and rebuild it in three days, save yourself by coming down from the cross. And in the same way, mocking him to one another, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. And those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. Every one of those who are insulting him, every one of you who hear now, every person, every being who has ever been created, who has ever lived or ever will live, will one day at the name of Jesus bow and confess that he is Lord and do that to the glory of God, the Father. But there, at the place of the skull, Jesus was mocked. And he received their mocking. He did not revile in return. Instead, he prayed, God, forgive them. As he poured out his blood for any who would turn and believe. And they mocked him with words, save yourself by coming down from the cross. It was within his power to save himself. He could have come down at any moment. But if he would have come down, he could not have saved us. Coming down would have been the easier task. With a word, he could have destroyed all the mockers. And yet, he endured he did not save himself so that the mockers could be saved. The mocking crowds misunderstood. They thought that his presence on the cross revealed weakness. He cannot save himself, the scribes jeered. His presence on the cross didn't reveal weakness, but power and love. The mockers believed that Jesus' death, that him hanging there invalidated his claims that he was who he said he was. They thought there's no way this could be the son of God if he would die like this. They thought they were justified in their unbelief and their rejection of him. The scribes mocked, come down now so that we may see and believe. They had already seen countless signs and didn't believe. Jesus would rise from the dead and many still would not believe. But now, Christian, gaze with eyes of faith. This isn't just a story. This is true. This is our Savior, our only hope, who left himself on the cross. Let the nails hold him. Let the mockers mock him. And he received the just punishment. Even while he was murdered unjustly, he received the just punishment for your and my sins. So gaze with eyes of faith on him hanging there and believe. Verse 33. And when the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of the bystanders heard it, they began 
saying, look, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink and said, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. God made him who knew no sin to be sin. Jesus hung there and the father rightly punished him. Not because he had done anything wrong. There was nothing in Jesus in and of himself that deserves that death. Quite the contrary. Justice was had there because my sin was on Jesus. That's why God forsook him. And as he uttered a loud cry, we learn in other gospels that he proclaimed, it's finished. He accomplished that for which he had come. And the veil of the sanctuary separating God from man was torn in two. We now have access to God by grace through faith. And God's still righteous. Praise God. And when the centurion, verse 39, who was standing in front of him, saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. The jeers thought that they were right in rejecting Jesus' claims as son of God because he died. But with eyes of faith, they were granted because of Jesus' death The centurion saw and believed and proclaimed truly this man was God's son. And that is who he is. We're going to remember now with a piece of bread and a cup of juice that God's son had flesh and blood and died. And if he is your savior, if you're a Christian, take the bread and juice, not based on your behavior, not based on how well you have obeyed, but because he died in your place. But if you're here and you're not a Christian, if maybe you're indifferent to his death, maybe you believe that he did die, but that you don't need it, that you don't need his death in your place, that you'll be all right before God on your own. If you believe in anything other than his death and his death alone to get you to God, let the bread and juice pass when it comes. Men, please serve us. But like the centurion, like the robber on his side, even if you didn't believe a minute ago, but you believe now, take the bread and juice with faith. Remember him and his death on your behalf. I'll close this in prayer in a minute.